Jerika, for those who haven't come across you online, introduce yourself and let our listeners know what we're talking about today. I am Dr. Jerika Dodd, and I am the founder and CEO of Your Pharmacy Advocate and the executive editor of Pharmacist Magazine. I've been a pharmacist for 24 years. Today, we're going to discuss Pharmacist Magazine and a new special edition, Pharmacer Magazine, celebrating men in pharmacy. Jerika, welcome back on the show. I never knew that you got your pharmacy degree when you were 15. Ah, well, you know. What state did you do that in? I can't tell all my secrets, Mike. <laughs> now, all right. So, Jerika, when you and I spoke last time, we were talking about pharmacists. And now, I know you came out with the male side of things, and I want to keep calling it pharma bro. But that's that Shrikeli guy, right? When right. That industry thing. No connection whatsoever. This is Pharma Sir. I wanted an equally classy name to describe my desire to celebrate men in pharmacy. Because when I started down this journey, on this journey three years ago, it was not only to celebrate women pharmacists, which is where I started, but you know, in yeah. time we added pharmacy technicians, we added pharmacy students. But it was also my goal to celebrate the men in pharmacy. But I knew that I couldn't do everything at once. So I took the journey in stages. And now we've arrived at the pharmacer journey. I think that's a great name. And I'm thinking to pharmacist. I suppose that could have been pharmacy, right? Possibly. Nope. I don't think that's as good as pharmacist. I'm just thinking the words it could have been. Right. Now, when I think of pharma, sir, were there any other words in the running? Were there any other concoctions or is that about the only, and I think it's great, but is, I'm just wondering, is that the only male thing we can come up with is pharma, sir? Well, I'm sure there could have been others, but when- It could have been pharma, he. No. No, no. that's not good. Not <laughs> bro good. just sounds- Oh, we don't, don't like know. bro. It, sounds, it just- That sounds a little familiar. <laughs> I'm not saying it should have been that. That just got in my mind from that guy. But there have been many times that I've been asked as I've gone around the country and I've spoken and talked about pharmacists, which actually is a play on the word pharmacist. There have been many times when people have said, so what's the male version, pharma bro? That's where it's from. Now I get it, right? Because pharmacist, you're talking about sister, and that's where the pharma bro comes in. Right. No, pharmacer is great. I like that. I like Thank that. Thank you. Thank you. And I really wanted to provide that platform where men in pharmacy could be celebrated because I know that we talked several years ago, this road of entrepreneurship and just leveling up in our careers, whether you're an entrepreneur or even an employee, that I think has had a renewed birth, if you will, in our profession because of all of the changes in the profession. I think we are finding more and more people looking around going, what can I do that's different? And so my goal is to share those stories, one, for the men and women in the magazine to market themselves. That's ultimately something that we were not trained to do in pharmacy school, but also so that the readers of the magazine, if they're sitting on the fence, if they're thinking, why me? Because I have a phrase that pharmacists are brilliantly insecure, mm. that if they're thinking, well, I wish I could do this, but I don't know, that they're able to read the stories of the men and now of the women and now the men in the magazine and be able to identify with someone that they can say, OK, I can reach out to that person or I can see the example and I can do it, too. Do you think male pharmacists looking at women pharmacists, do you think there's any thing in the way of them picturing themselves in that position I think that men can see women do things, but I think it's easier when, and I think that's a human nature uh, trait to be able to see someone that looks like yourself and you're going to relate to them usually naturally faster than you would someone who doesn't look like you. So I believe having men and women is a positive because not only are they 
to, can they see someone of the same or different gender, which is not really the focus, but they can see someone who's done it. Someone who has blazed a trail that maybe they hadn't even considered. The closer it is, probably the easier, because I can look at someone and say, well, he's more slender than I am, but he's bald. You know what I mean? You don't have to make that big of a jump. And I know my dad was a pharmacist, and that made it easier for me to be a pharmacist. If my old man can do it, I can do it. You see that a lot with right. a lot of jobs like that, physicians and things like that, where the kids are like, this isn't a big hurdle. My dad did it for right. sake. Absolutely. And I think that it's also helpful for current students. We have to think about the generation that they're in and I can imagine being a student in pharmacy school now. I've talked to many students and they share their apprehension and their anxieties of what's the job market going to be like when I get to the end of my academic career, if you will, and what's that going to look like? So I think it also provides a role model and examples for students who are thinking, I've chosen this road of pharmacy and I'm sure they see all of the news and things that are happening. And they're saying, is there going to be a place for me? At the time when I graduated pharmacy school and I went on and completed a residency, it was not quite the commodity market that it is today. Right. As I see students who unfortunately don't match for whatever reasons, obviously there are not as many positions as there are applicants. So yeah. when you see students who don't match for residencies and it really seems to be the end of the world, or at least sounds like it in many mm -hmm. cases, I want students to also see, I want technicians to also see that there are other techs, there are other students, there are pharmacists that are doing things that there is something, there's a place for you. I have shirts that say everyone needs a pharmacist, obviously, because I am a pharmacist. And I really do believe that whether it's practicing in the clinical sense or the sense that society views a pharmacist, no matter what it is, everyone needs a pharmacist. You know, I wonder, and I don't, you don't know the answer to this. I'm just commenting here, but you know, it's like when people assume certain sexes with certain roles, it's like back in the day, you always heard about nurses. And then once in a while, you'll hear a male person saying, I'm going to be a nurse and it takes just a second for your mind to shift. And you say, well, that's a great profession. Good job. That's wonderful. But at first you were thinking female probably. And right. I wonder if pharmacy will ever have that female slant on it. Because it's already, what is it, 65% I think it's even female, maybe more than that. 70? Yeah. Yes. Same with like grade school teachers and flight yes. attendants. Back in the day, you called them stewardesses. But those were certain female professions. I think those days are over, though, where anybody will say that's a female versus male because there's so many examples on the internet. And it's just a, it's a different world, I think. Right, definitely. And I think that though the profession is majority women, at least from the percentages that we see currently, I don't know if people automatically assume, though, that pharmacists are women. No, um, I don't think I, so. I don't think so. I don't think so. When you look at a, a curve of time in people's lives where they aspire to be manager and then this and then CEO and then business owner, this and that, it's a very similar curve. You'd be astounded by that. I'm mid-50s. If I talk to someone in mid-50s, remarkably, they'd all feel about like I do. And there's some outliers. I know Colonel Sanders started KFC when he was like 65. There's some outliers, but most people, they're on the same trajectory of desires as far as leadership and then starting to go down and so on. When you look at your perspective guests in the magazine... Are you seeing that trajectory and what ages are you usually coming across in the male pattern of where they are in certain times in their life? And would you say that mimics the females guess in your pharmacist magazine or is that graph shifted at all either way? I, from what I've seen, I feel that it is about the same between genders. 
that I think, and I think part of that is due to several different reasons. Number one, I think it's how we're socialized in our society. You grow up, you go to college, you get a degree, you get a good job. And I think that partially is impacted by if our parents were in those entrepreneurial or leadership or executive type roles or not. I think that impacts that. I think that the other piece that is impacting that is our profession and the job market itself. So my understanding is that from 2020 to 2030, there's going to be a decrease in the number of jobs so that if you and I were likely looking for a job. We might not be able to find one. We've had an increase in pharmacy schools over that 10 year span. Just as an example, there will be a decrease in jobs. So I think that's a factor that impacts that point in life where you go, I think I want to do something different or something more. Yeah. I think our own mortality starts to come into view and you realize when you get to be 40 something that you could mm -hmm. have potentially lived half or almost half of your life. Yeah. And so you're starting to think more about what mark do I want to leave on the world, which mm -hmm. is I feel broader than what mark do I want to leave on my profession. Yeah. And I think you have. So there are lots of things that impact where we get to in our careers. I think for women, when we just think from a physiological perspective, I think we may see more women peak a little later in age, and that may be due to a decline in estrogen over mm. time. And so there's less, less desire to nest, if you will, mm. and mm -hmm. raise a family because that's already usually taken place. So then if you think about even the women that have run for president, They've definitely been past the child rearing years and it's kind of, I'm ready to go take on the world, yeah. if you will. So there are all types of factors that I feel that play into that. But I would say that the average person in the magazine has the, or the average range of age has been yeah. usually about 35 to, I've had women who have been in their mid fifties. And then with regard to the recent issue of the magazine, I'm seeing about that same spread as well. My demographic for the listeners of this podcast are about 70% male. And the top rung is the 35 to 45. So the average listener is a 40 year old male. They're maybe past being managed and wanting to manage, whether that's ownership or doing some other endeavor. And then maybe at my age, you kind of maybe know what you know already or something like that. And I heard a stat not too long ago that just in thinking about podcast listeners in general, that they're majority male. And I did, I think I heard like 65% of men are make up the audience of podcast listeners, and mm. I did not realize that, but that's interesting as well. There's a author, his name is Seth Godin. He basically writes a lot of marketing stuff, but okay. his comment to people is do something so much so that when you're not there, people miss you. And that's Ooh. exactly why I've done my Monday morning podcast with these updates and so on. And you just keep putting it out there and get to the point where if you weren't there, people would notice. And that for me, besides hopefully, well, of course, a quality guess, but besides that, just that repetitive publication of that gets people in the habit of using you, but so much so that if you weren't there, they would notice. And if they notice, that means there's a little bit of a need or a desire for that. Absolutely. I have had people say to me, because there have been times along this journey where I've taken a little step back from social media, which is my one of my main modalities for marketing. And I've had people say, I don't see you anymore. Are you okay? I've had people send me messages and say, are you okay? Is everything all right? And while I don't do that to alarm or alert anyone, it's actually 
quite interesting that someone misses you because you think about the just the fast pace of social media and it's constantly changing and updating that it's interesting when someone says, I haven't seen you for a minute. And when I have people say, I've been following you for years. First of all, I have to remember that there have been a couple of years. And because first of all, your thoughts are, I haven't been doing that long enough for you to say I've been following you for years, but I have. And I agree with you. It's one of those situations where I, for me, I put my head down and keep going. And so I didn't even realize that even this year with the magazines and the special issues that we are publishing this year, we went from one magazine in 2019 and now we're in 2022. And if we are on schedule, we will complete seven magazines. We will publish wow. seven this year. And so you, I just kind of came to that realization the other day when I just sat and added them up because I've been working on them each, but you go, you hold your head up and go, whoa, we really made a big leap this year. It proves that, yes, you put your head down and you make things a habit and you go, because I look at the number of shows that I've had and it's like, where the hell did that number come from? That's, but it was just, it's just a weekly thing. It's a cadence. It's a cadence. For my stuff, there's not much I do that doesn't go on my do list. And my do list has just a ton of repeat functions. So every yes. week I don't say to myself, I'm doing a podcast this week. I say, oh, here's this practice, whether it's posting here or doing that. And I just knock that off. So it's a labor of love, of course, but right. without that repetitive motion, things become more of a dream, more of a long-term goal and not a stepwise process. Right. Right. Dorica, when you say your magazine, what's the percent of online magazine where you have that flip thing, you know, I don't, I don't know what the hell they call it, but like a, a fancy PDF magazine versus hard copy. Do you have both? I do have both. Is it like half and half? I would say about it, probably close to half and half with more being digital. I think in this digital age that we're in, Hey, you'd love to be all digital, right? I mean, if you could. Well, actually, no, because part of the experience that I have created, especially for those who are in the magazine, nine times out of 10, most of us will not have had the opportunity to see ourselves in a magazine. Oh. I mean, it's not like you, it's an everyday occurrence, if you will. Yes. And so there's the thing that I say about pharmacists is we're brilliantly insecure. Mm. So many times when a pharmacist digs in like you and I do, and yeah. we put our head down and we go to work, we're working on the thing. Hmm. And it's very rare that we raise our head up and look around. Like I said, oh my gosh, we're doing seven magazines, seven yeah. publications this year. Right. You, it kind of takes you off guard because we are definitely great worker bees, whether it's for ourselves or for others. However, the experience that I've crafted is I want woman and now man who is featured in the magazine to stop because there's a difference in seeing yourself hmm. online on social media or on an online digital version of a magazine, but to right. hold it in your hand and to flip to your page and go, wow, I am the CEO of this business, or I mm. am the CEO of my career. That is the experience that I create and want to continue creating. So even if we were to cancel or discontinue the print versions of the magazine for subscribers, I would still have that as a feature for those who are featured because I think every one of them needs the experience of holding the magazine in their hand and seeing themselves. That's really cool. Yeah. We don't tend to see ourselves as the CEO of our business or as the CEO of our career. And I think that it has a lot to do with our mindset. One, we were not socialized or groomed that way in pharmacy school. We were, we were trained to be fulfillment in a long cascade. There's marketing, there's sales, and there's fulfillment. We were trained to be at the end of that line and fulfill the order, whether it be clinical practice or whether it be actual filling a prescription. And many times when we set off into the other thing, that different phase of life where it's, I want to lead, I want to 
leave my impact on the profession and on the world, we don't see ourselves. And I think to be able to see yourself gives you perspective, number one, in how the world sees you. And then two, I think it gives you perspective to say, to stand in the place that you are to, to the shoes that you're to fill in doing whatever it is you've been called to do. When I first started as an entrepreneur with my consulting practice, there is still not a picture of me on that website. And I leave it that way on purpose because I wanted to be a part of the background. I was like, no one needs to know that it's mine. I said things like people won't buy from a black woman because that's what I really believe. I had lots of limiting beliefs. But as time went on, someone said to me, if you're going to be in running this business, you've got to get out front of it. You've got to be the face of it. So that's why I'm on the cover of the women's magazine, because I was in the process of building a brand. It's not about a vein wanting to see my face or anything like that. But it's so important because I still get in my head. I'm just as analytical as the next pharmacist. But when I come to my desk each day and I see this, I am reminded that I can do whatever I set my mind to do. It doesn't mean that there won't be challenges or what have you for whatever reason. However, my mindset is it can be done. I went from idea in my head to magazine in, in my heart to magazine in my hand in 90 days. So that's where I get that phrase. Don't tell me what's not possible. A magazine spread. You don't really need that when you have your billion dollars. It would have been nice when you were starting. Right, right. There, think about the example of one of the women in the early edition, of, or early uh, publication of the Pharmacist magazine. And when I approached her about being in the magazine, she was like, well, I, I'm not there yet. I haven't done this and this. I've even had women, women say, I don't have my website together or for whatever reason that people give you. And I remember her saying, I am so, because we've talked two years later, she said, I am so glad that I went ahead with being in the magazine because that was the impetus that got me and my wheels turning. And I started making things happen because I said in that magazine that this was what I was going to do. And she has now done it. And so she said, I'm so glad I didn't wait because I think that is a trait of probably just humans in general. But obviously I talk with a lot of pharmacists and pharmacy professionals of I'll do it when this condition is right or that condition is perfect. And I don't think there, that exists. When you're trying to conquer a goal, it used to be like, tell people about your goals because then you're wedded to them. But yes. I've heard, contrary to that, I've heard where people say, and this would be for me, don't tell people your goals because you've already experienced the accolades of doing it when you haven't done it. It'd be like me saying, I'm going to do an Ironman. And everybody would say to me, it's great. It's great. Well, if you can get greats for just saying it, why do the damn thing? You've already got your accolades. However, if it's in print for the world to see, you're not just talking your family and friends. If it's in print for the world to see, you better damn well get things going because it's there. I agree. And I would say, Mike, that my take on sharing your goals or not, it's kind of twofold. Number one, I generally operate in silence because I don't mm. necessarily think that the entire world is excited yeah. for you. Sure. I think that there are definitely sometimes, unfortunately, people who are just waiting to see if you're going to fall or if you're going to quote unquote fail. However, I do believe in sharing your goals with people that you can trust around you who will hold you accountable, who will say, hey, I thought that you were going to so that you do continue when you need that push, when you need that level of accountability. And so I think that's a mixed bag. I don't necessarily announce to any and everyone, but to my closest circle, I've definitely been having conversations like I'm going to bring out the 
Pharmaceur magazine. And even when I got to a point where I knew we were ready to move forward, even having limited conversation, just because I also think it's, I think I have the best job in the world making these types of announcements because it brings me such joy to celebrate others in the profession. It does not take anything away from me. And I think that unfortunately in the grand scheme of healthcare, pharmacists are overlooked often or not recognized for some of the day-to-day things that we do. And so I love that my job is to make a big deal out of what other people do. You gotta be real careful who you share things with, especially if you're looking for uh, support. Right. Let's say my kids told some teacher this or some leader. I'm like, why the hell would you tell them? You knew they weren't going to support that. It's like you were <laughs> testing yourself or trying to get their approval when you knew damn well they weren't going to approve that. I think there is something human about us telling the wrong person if you will, because maybe we're just hoping, maybe just maybe we'll get that shred of approval from them. Yes. How fulfilling is it to tell somebody, someone that you're pretty darn sure they're going to give you a lot of support? You're probably going to say, good job, no matter what I did. But if I could turn the corner on this person who 99% of the time is probably going to question, if I can get that one time, then I'd be really excited because I won them over. I think the older we get, you start to really care less about people's opinions. For and sure. Because you realize that everyone has one. That's why actually when I led with the post for the Pharmacer magazine, I said that it wasn't a it wasn't a conference call. And I talked about how it wasn't on a party line if the reader was old enough to even remember what a party line was. Yeah. And that I did not really have multiple discussions about what I knew I wanted to do. You had a pretty firm vision. Yes. I don't necessarily have to have a consensus or everyone's buy-in before I can move forward. Because I think that, number one, that takes time to get. Number two, like you said, you're trying to win over people. Don't know that I have that time either. And three, I know that what I've been tasked to put into the world, it's bigger than a pharmacist or a, phar or a pharmacy tech or student here in the United States. It's a global thing. It's quite a remarkable time we're living in now because who would have thought years ago that with just your own drive, you could do something like the podcast or have a magazine come out or something like that. You couldn't do that. People now, the younger generation, there's not a concept of going through the middleman. I say it on the show quite often. I mean, that's for the whole casting couch, the whole Me Too kind of thing where people had to sleep their way to the top. If you didn't, you don't make it past any directors or whatever. You know, these creepy guys, you didn't make it past them because that was your middleman. It's a remarkable time now where people just, Bounce around that Justin Bieber and all these people. It's like there's no middleman anymore. Maybe in some industries, like book publishing. I talked to an author on this. It'd probably be hard to do a, a book without going through some publishing house. It can be done, but there's certain industries that still can use some help. But it's nice that that middleman's not there anymore so much. Yes. And it's why I think that as a profession, it's so important. You, I know, heard me say it before, your dreams are urgent because I think having had a middleman or having had the naysayers or like, how are you going to do that? However, is that going to happen? Now with more of that being removed, I really do think that it's possible to build whatever it is that you want to see, be it in healthcare, be it in whatever gap you find in life, you can potentially solve that or at least attempt to solve it. You know, just so much is sped up. I mean, can you imagine the stuff that you put out, you know, you're not sure which way this has to go. And years ago, you might have spent $100,000 to have focus groups and all that kind of stuff. And now you just put out two posts on LinkedIn and like 
the next day you have this many attention on this and that on that. And you're like, okay, we're going to go in that direction today. That kind of stuff. It's just amazing. It's almost like instant feedback, yet that allows you to adjust course. While we were talking about consistency earlier and having that cadence, you can yeah. keep that cadence and make adjustments really quickly while you're continuing to consistently yes. show up. You maybe alluded to this, but there's a lot of room in pharmacy leadership, and it's not a zero-sum game. If I'm successful at this, doesn't mean you're not successful at that. Typically, and especially some of the stuff that you and I are doing in a crap load of other people, the information... One information doesn't keep the other information down. It's kind of like when you go into a mall in the food court, there's a reason why there's 20 restaurants there is because everybody gets lifted up. So if another magazine came out, they would be, oh, look at this genre of information coming up with more magazines. Oh, pharmacy has hit this level. Let's read all of them kind of thing. It's There's a lot of room for a lot of people, especially with vision. I agree with you. There have been several magazines that I have seen, and whenever I do catch wind of them or see them, I actually reach out to that magazine contact or publisher, whomever it is that I know that's connected with it. You mean those bastards that are trying to take over what you're doing? But I don't see it that way. No. I see it. And I, again, I believe that to tell someone congratulations or to wish them well does not take anything away from me. It doesn't. And so I actually, when I see any new magazine, I reach out and say congratulations because Same. I believe that one, there's room, there's plenty of room for everyone. There's plenty yep. of room for us to all do what we've been called to do. And one of the things that I can imagine that when we spoke a couple of years ago, I somehow had to allude to is your story. If there were someone who was doing the exact same thing as me in the earth, the thing that makes me and them is who we are as individuals. And we are all unique and we all have a different story. Besides having that attitude, it just makes business sense. Who right. knows how your paths are going to cross with collaboration or whatever. Maybe not, mm -hmm. but it's a big enough world. I actually reached out as we were preparing to lay out Pharmacer magazine. And I reached out to a another publication and said, hey, I'd love to have an ad for your magazine and what you're doing that focuses on the men in your your entity to to be highlighted and that's another magazine but i believe that there's room for everyone and that magazine publisher or owner was like yes and after this is all over we definitely have to sit down and connect because i like to sit and think about what's possible if you're competing selling a doorbell to somebody you know it's like you only have so many doors you only have so many doorbells you're only gonna have one when it comes to attention and knowledge and media and things like that, it's like someone who sees good stuff is going to be encouraged to look for other good stuff kind of thing. I have even been approached about publishing others' magazines, and that's something that I'm definitely going to move into and go in that direction as well, because I've learned a lot in these three years, and I think it's only fitting to support others who want to put together a magazine and publish as well. And definitely, I don't see competition. No. I see how do I help this person put their voice into the earth or their ideas in, out into the profession so that others can consume, read, and learn from. It's amazing how much you know now, for example, about this process. It's just amazing. And some of the odds and ends I do for this show, I'll do something that I thought about when I was like, you know, 20, you know, doing some sound something or other. And you don't even know what you're bringing to it, but you're just bringing so many experiences to that. It's just amazing. You know a lot more than you think you know. Yes. 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 Because you're learning every day. As I said, we every put our day. heads down 
and you don't realize the amount of knowledge and just even understanding the market. The market for pharmacists is different from the market for pharmacists. And so even the market for the magazine in the United States is different from the market in other countries. And so understanding that has probably been one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that not to just assume that because you've done something one way in a place, that it's going to be a cookie cutter approach to duplicating it in another market or with another demographic. So that in itself has been a big lesson. Yeah. And not only talking about your knowledge, when you have to learn something under the duress of, you know, failure. And once in a while, my kids will say, dad, you're a fast typer. Uh, nah, but you know, I'm relatively speaking, you know, you're a fast typer. And it's like, how'd you get fast? It's like, well, back in the day when the store was busier and things like that, it's like, if I didn't type fast, I didn't have dinner. You right. know, if I couldn't get through data entry back in the day, I didn't have dinner. And so it's, I wanted to eat kind <laughs> of thing or like with computer issues. I tend to solve computer issues, not because I'm some technological whiz, but if, if a computer went down, you went out of business. You right. didn't have an option of throwing it to the side. So no. that's your stuff too. As you do your magazine skills, you didn't have an option just to not do it and walk away from it. You were committed to the process and to your customers and things like that. One of the things that I tell my coaching clients, because I think in pharmacy, as pharmacists or as pharmacy professionals, we're used to solving a certain set of problems. But mm. then when we're out of that environment, so you become an entrepreneur and you're the jack of all trades for a minute until you can start hiring a team or what have you. And so one of the things that I say to my coaching clients is business owners solve problems first for themselves, then for other people. So when the computer breaks down or whatever happens in the system, in the workflow, there is no, oh, I'm just going to call tech support and that's their problem. Whatever it is, you are that, especially in the beginning until you realize you've reached your limitation and you do need to call someone in. But business owners solve problems. And so in solving problems, one of the ways that we help our customers and our clients and our stakeholders understand that we can solve their problems is to be able to solve our own and say, hey, this is what I, this is what I did for, for sure. myself. And so you're right. It becomes this. You can't just throw it to the side. You've either got to take the time to dig in and figure it out or realize when you've reached the level of, I say, your pay grade and someone else needs to step in and help solve that problem. But either way, it's the problem generally still has to be solved. Working with some of these male entrepreneurs, as a woman, do you bring certain skills to them that you think a man may not bring, whether it's a certain direction you see that might be more typical of women's skills than men's skills. For example, on a whole, women might be more verbal than we men that just grunt a lot, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Do you bring any skills of that or any comforting skills that a woman might have better than a man? So I don't know that I would have necessarily pegged it to be because I'm a woman, but I yeah. think naturally being a woman, I tend to be more nurturing. Well, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. I, even as I have coached men as coaching clients, I know most people know me for speaking to women in pharmacy, and that's definitely true. However, that's why in my recent summit, I said women in pharmacy and a few good men because there you go. I, I speak to men as well, obviously with the magazine and through coaching. So I think that I bring a level of understanding and a level of nurturing. So when I make the statement to say pharmacists are brilliantly insecure, I don't just mean women in pharmacy are brilliantly insecure. I think just in general, because of the way we fit in the hierarchy sometimes of the healthcare system in that the doctor is the lead and we are to take cue and direction from the physician. And I think that lends to some of the insecurities that we have as pharmacists sometimes. However, I'd like to think that my ability to 
coach with regard to confidence, Mm. because I don't think confidence is just or lack of confidence is just a problem for women. I Mm -hmm. also tend to I think one of the things that I enjoy the most about looking or connecting with another individual is thinking about what's possible. So I bring Mm -hmm. that skill of being able to look at a situation that I, as my father would say, I don't have a dog in that fight. But look at a situation and think of and brainstorm relatively quickly and say, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? And I love being able to do that. But I don't know if necessarily that's a trait because I'm a woman. I think that it's just one of my gifts. There's a lot of stuff that we men lack that I think women can bring. I mean, just for example my wife or my daughter will tell more stories or they're more verbal and they'll tell more stories and add more life to issues. As I think of like a magazine, it's story and it's sharing and those kind of things. Women just do a better job at some of that stuff. I think you maybe could pull out more and pull out more of the the cavemen and get us more into the, uh, you know, the story is everybody likes a story. Right. Well, and I have done that with both genders because there are pharmacists who will tell you their pharmacy story. Mm. And I don't espouse to telling a different story based upon what audience I'm in front of. My story is my story, no matter who I'm standing in front of. And it doesn't matter if they are in a healthcare profession or not, I believe that my story is my story. And so actually I have done more as I'm working with the featured men and women in the magazine, I am helping them to share their story and not hide behind it, not give that official pharmacy version that sounds like I I was born in 1962 and I went to kindergarten in 1967. That's a chronological telling of your story, but really sharing, as I like to say, the good, the bad, and the ugly, because oftentimes I think as healthcare professionals, we like to dress up and share the good and maybe a little bad. It's just more interesting. I'll do that with my guests and I give a little bit of information. And and one of the first things I say is, we're going to talk about stuff, but we're not going to go chronologically. We're going to jump into something that's going to be over here and maybe come back and grab it. I say, trust the process, but we're going to go into some things that might be a little embarrassing or a little bit, because if not, it's cold. Well, and I think that especially even, well, prior to the pandemic, but after we have been through two years plus now of a pandemic, I think that the essential thing that's needed by all humans, is to be known, be heard, be understood by someone. And so I don't think that it does any good to give a a dressed up stoic version of what we think people want to hear. Maybe I'm getting cold and uninterested in things, but, and if someone talked about something I, I'm interested in, I might want the details, like kind of like making some music. So if people talk to me about a new synthesizer kind of thing, I might be interested in the details. But whenever somebody either in print or audibly starts telling me about their like schooling and where they spent time and things like that, that is so freaking boring to me because it's all the damn same. I don't really care where you went to school. And I know that you had this PGY and PG this, and I know you did that. I don't give a crap. Tell me something different. But if I'm going to hire someone, I guess I don't want the different to be something like, you know, my hobby is juggling or something like that. But I just want it a little bit different. It's just some of this stuff is so boring. You know, Mike, I agree with you. And it's why when I'm coaching and when I am publishing the magazine, I read all of it because I'm not committed to producing boring because If I wanted to know where any individual went to school, I could probably find that in a couple of keystrokes online. We include that information in the feature of each person in the magazines. However, that's not the focus. I think that 
pharmacists, if you ever are in a group of pharmacy professionals and people have to introduce themselves, listen to, like you said, how long they go on about what they've done, where they went to school. And when I think about any client that I've ever served, they have never asked me where I went to school. My patient consulting clients have never said, is your license active? All people want to know is, can you help me solve my problem? That's what people want to know. And so I think that we should spare the details because I say this, that we're all smart. Speak for yourself, (laughs) Jerika. We're all smart and we all have at least a couple of alphabets that we could put behind our name, which if you tell the truth, anybody outside of our profession doesn't even know what that means. So are we putting that behind our name to impress each other? We're all smart. And so I think that telling your story is a much more powerful way to connect than for me to give you the long rap sheet of my academic achievements or even my career achievements. I don't think that's the way. I think sharing with you who I am and what I've been placed here to put into the world is more interesting and intriguing than me running down the list of things you could probably find on your own without me saying. There's a chance people don't ask about my schooling because they might not be sure I ever finished. They don't want to embarrass me. I believe you finished. And I've never asked because I just, I take for granted that you finished. Oh, I thought you were one of them. No, no. You said that pharmacists are brilliant. I can't even say the damn word. They're brilliantly insecure. Let me try that word again. They're brilliantly insecure. Does that mean we find out great ways to be insecure? Or does it mean that they're smart, but they're insecure? What do you mean by that? Smart, but we have insecurities about putting things out that have not happened before or that we don't see a template or an example of. I think that if you think about the way we're trained, we worked off of formulas and algorithms and things that were specified that you put in these components and you get this output. And so when we get to this part of our lives and we're not necessarily running it all through a formula or an algorithm and we don't know how it might turn out, especially if it's not been done before, then that's where some of the insecurity comes in. And we've been socialized to believe, well, that's not what a pharmacist does. I remember when I was leaving my role in the pharma industry, I remember being told, well, pharmacists, I didn't even know they could be entrepreneurs Hmm. because people have expectations. And I think society has expectations of what you should do with such a noble education, if you will. However, I believe that's where some of the insecurity comes because we may be worried about what people will say. Will they approve? We talked about sharing your goals with other people. And that's where I come up with that phrase of pharmacists are brilliantly insecure because we are amazingly smart. You know, it's interesting where that went because, yes, pharmacists, it seems like they're always, you know, saluting up to the physicians and things. But if you think back like, you know, 50 years Practically every pharmacist that graduated did so because they were an entrepreneur and they were going to open up a pharmacy or do something like that. But there's a lot of beauty in just having your job in front of you and getting paid for it. Right. Is it too late, though? Have they been indoctrinated into this profession so much or is there hope? It definitely is a mindset shift and probably a bit of deprogramming from how we're used to operating. But mm-hmm. as you look at just strictly healthcare. And the place that pharmacists have even filled in the healthcare scheme, if you will, just the pandemic, how pharmacists have been available, ready to serve, ready to help, Mm -hmm. to how pharmacists are creating all types of pathways in personalized medicine and helping with nutrition and deprescribing and all these things that we can do. I think Mm -hmm. that pharmacists are really beginning to forge their own path where they're not necessarily waiting to be told what's needed, but Mm -hmm. they are identifying a need and then building whatever it is that they feel will help answer the call for whatever's needed. I think for pharmacists, 
to be successful in the entrepreneurial range is that they've got to truly find a need. And I think one issue that I've talked to some guests, I forget who it was, but one issue that got pharmacists in a little bit of trouble is they were doing this and they didn't like this so much. So they said, we want to start doing this and let's say more clinical, but instead of seeing that need, they kind of put the cart before the horse. They said, we're going to train everybody. So they're way up here. Yet it wasn't really a proven need. And now you've got double training and they're still feeling unneeded. And so I think it's important that you do f see a hole or you do see a need to fill and not go out and try to create a need just because you have a higher degree or higher training. Yes. And I think that need is perfectly matched up with your innate desires because to be trained to do something that you absolutely hate, that's no good either. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, you may do it well, but it's, we talked about how life is precious. And so how many hours do we want to be at work, whether it's for someone or for ourselves? How many hours do we want to be at work doing something that we don't genuinely enjoy? Yeah. Compared to the fact that, oh, but I do it well. So I agree that there is the need, there's the desire, which I would equate with passion. And those, I think, need to be married in order to find that sweet spot, if you will, on how you want to serve, how you want to give, what you want to, or the way that you want to impact, as well as having that personal satisfaction, because I think that's important. At the end of all of our careers, I don't think any of us in this day and age want to sit back and go, well, I served well even though I hated it the whole time. My goal is to reach as many healthcare professionals in general, but specifically those in the pharmacy profession, such that they can respond personally with a role or with a business or with whatever it is they want in their career that first gives them satisfaction, but two, leaves the impact that all of us went into this profession to create. I think the biggest thing, especially we talked about the small steps you can take on the computer and so on to get stuff going is, it seems you got to be moving. I think of like an airplane or a ship. It's like you don't steer it when it's not moving. It doesn't do anything. But when it starts to move and then you steer and you a little bit this way and that way, it's like it seems the movement is where you make progress, even if the movement not backwards, but even if the movement is somewhat forward, right. seems like that's a way to get going. And that's where I think just giving them some confidence to make that first small move is a big thing. Yes. Because generally when we get to a point in life and we say, okay, I'm going to go a different direction. It's daunting. It's scary. Too big. And we try to see that formula, if you will, all the way to what the answer is going to be in the outcome. And unfortunately, life doesn't always work like that. No, it's smaller yes. steps. Well, Jerika, Golly, good having you on again. Nice Thank talking you. to you. Thank you. I appreciate you. And keep doing what you're doing. We all need that push. We all need a little push sometimes, a little bit of a a knowledge of outside of ourself, like your magazine is doing for the people that are in it. Someone looking in from the outside and saying, you can do it. And we all need that. Yes. Yes. And I am so inspired and excited to be able to help those in the pharmacy profession share their stories. We'll put your website in the show notes and I know they can see on there all yes. the good things we talked about. All right, Jerika, take care. Talk to you soon. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.